Life groups this term are going to be on 1 John, trying to complement the morning sermon series that we uh, began there just in September. Now, with other things being on this September, with Cafe Church and the Presbytery Mission in Ireland evening and Worship Louder on those Sunday evenings, life groups aren't scheduled to begin until the 2nd of October. But I thought I'd just put together this video, a short video for well, life group members or any groups that want to meet before then, or, or anyone really, to just have a little bit of an introduction to 1 John. Then there'll be four studies from October to go alongside the Sunday series. The first thing I want to do actually is a bit of a cheat, uh, because I want to encourage you to watch the Bible Project video on 1, 2 and 3 John, those letters of John. Or, or at least for now, just watch the first five minutes. I've put the first five minutes on here, it's about to come up. Or you can go to YouTube and you can put in Bible Project 1 to 3 John and the whole thing should come up. It's just under 10 minutes, the whole video. But watch this, just the first five minutes and I'll be back. The letters of 1st, 2nd and 3rd John. 1st John is actually anonymous, but 2nd and 3rd John are written by someone who's called the Elder. Now the language and style of all three of these works are identical to each other and to John's Gospel. And so most people think that all of them come from the disciple that Jesus loved. Now that could be John the son of Zebedee, one of the twelve apostles, or it could be another John among Jesus' earliest disciples known as John the Elder. Whichever John it was, he's now in his old age and he's overseeing a network of house church communities that are likely around the city of ancient Ephesus. Now from clues within the gospel and from these letters, it seems that these communities were made up mostly of Jewish followers of Jesus and that they had recently gone through a crisis that motivated John to write these letters. He mentions that a group of people have broken off from these churches. These people no longer acknowledge Jesus as Israel's Messiah or as the Son of God. And they're stirring up hostility among those who stayed faithful to the churches. In fact, 2nd and 3rd John clearly address this conflict. 2nd John is a warning to a specific house church. There are people who deny Jesus. John calls them deceivers. And they're probably going to come looking for validation or support. And this church community is not to offer any. 3rd John is actually written to a member of one of these house churches, a man named Gaius. And the elder asks him to welcome legitimate missionaries who are going to arrive soon. He has to tell him to do this because the leader of that church community, Diotrephes, is acting like a jerk. And he's rejecting anybody associated with John the elder. And so these letters give us a window into the tension and conflict that John faced in these churches. And 1 John was written as a response to all of this as a form of damage control. The elder assures those who still believe in the Messiah, Jesus, that God is with them as they adhere to the truth. And so all of this helps us understand the uniqueness of 1 John, which is actually not a letter at all. It reads more like a poetic sermon sent to these churches. John says that he's not communicating new information. In fact, almost all of the key ideas and words in 1 John come right out of Jesus' teachings in the Gospel of John. And so John's goal is to remind them and persuade these Christians to stay true to what they already say they believe. The poetic quality of John's sermon is really cool. He doesn't develop his ideas in a linear or logical way. Rather, he uses a well-known technique of ancient rhetoric called amplification. So John has just a few core ideas he wants to communicate about life and truth and love. And he's going to cycle around these ideas repeatedly, each time offering a little bit different of an angle or emphasis. He uses a lot of hyperbole. He uses very stark contrasts with simple images of light and dark and love and hate and good and evil. But don't let the simplicity of 1 John fool you. This work is deeply profound. There's a clear introduction to 1 John and then a clear conclusion. And the flowing cycles of the sermon in between these two don't follow any kind of rigid literary design. But there do seem to be two larger sections. Each one is marked off by the introductory phrase, this is the message. And then each is followed by a repetition of images about how God is first light and then how God is love. 
And all of the ideas in these two parts flow out of and cycle back into these two core ideas. So the introduction is very similar to the prologue of the Gospel of John. It has echoes of Genesis chapter 1 and Proverbs chapter 8. John speaks of the word of life that was with God in the beginning. For John, the word God refers to both the Father and the Son who came to bring life into the world. And so those who saw and heard and touched the Son are called we. John's referring to himself and the apostles who were eyewitnesses of Jesus. And so now we have a message for you, the next generation of Jesus' followers. So when the apostles share the word of life with others, these others are also brought into fellowship with the Father and the Son through the apostles. The word fellowship here is koinonia in Greek. It means a participation or sharing. When people hear the message about Jesus through the apostles, that message brings them into a real relationship with Jesus himself and into a real participation in God's own love and life. And so this flows right into the first minute. Well, I do think those Bible Project videos are brilliant, are packing in a lot of information visually. Don't feel you have to have taken all of that in by any means, but it does begin to get us into the letters a little bit, and especially uh, First John. As the video said, and I've said uh, on Sunday mornings, the writer of the letters, those three letters, was the same as the writer of John's Gospel. Let's just call him John. But it's good to think about why he wrote the Gospel, and then why he's written, especially this letter, 1 John. The video talked about the possibility of house churches in Ephesus and with a crisis with people perhaps wandering away from faith. Well, that may well have been the case. But for now, I simply want us to think about the reason that John gives for writing the gospel in John 20, verse 31, and for writing the letter in 1 John 5, verse 13. They're similar as you look at them, but also slightly different. Well, in a moment, you could pause this video for a few minutes and look up those two verses yourself and have a think about how they compare and contrast and complement each other. And how might looking at both of them together help us think about the purpose of 1 John beyond the gospel that he's written? And then, just before you pause, for a bonus point if you'd like one, why don't you look up these other references that I'll put on the screen? There are different points in the letter of 1 John where John says why he's writing this letter. Have a look at these verses and think how these statements about why he's writing, I write for this reason, I'm writing to you, how they feed into his bigger purpose for writing 1 John as a whole. And so think as we receive this as a letter or maybe it was a poetic sermon, as we receive it and read it, what's our expectation of what God might be wanting to say to us as believers through our listening to and our study of 1 John? So pause the video, have a look at those two verses, have a look at other verses in 1 John that talk about why he's writing the letter. Have a think, discuss it with others if you're with them, if you're with them. What are our expectations as we read 1 John of what God might want to say to us? Well, having thought about that, uh, here's, a, here's a second thing you can do. Open your Bible to John's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 1 to 14 and read that really well-known opening of John's Gospel. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Read on from there, up till verse 14, or maybe verse 18 if you like. And then keep your finger in that passage, or on another device, look up 1 John 1, verses 1 to 4, the first four verses of John's first letter. When you've read them both, do another little compare and contrast. Where do you see words and ideas and themes connecting across those two introduction passages? Make a list, if you like, of what you think John's important 
themes and ideas are from the very start then of his letter. What do you think are the big things? He's wanting believers like us to get our heads uh, and even our lives around. For the four life group studies that we're going to explore in October and November, we're going to look at those four big themes, which you've already seen in the video. And no doubt, as you've been looking at the text of John's Gospel on 1 John, we're going to look at light, truth, life and love. But for now, let me just leave you with a couple of questions around those opening four verses of 1 John. And the first one is this. John, as you'll have read, makes a big thing of the, let's call it the multi-sensory experience of the word of life. A thing which has been from the beginning, which we've heard, which we've seen, which we've looked at with our eyes, which we've touched with our hands. The life appeared, he says, we proclaim what we've seen and heard. When John's talking about all those senses and what he and the others have experienced, what do you think he's trying to emphasise? Why do you think that is so important to him and for us? There may be more than one thing you want to take away from that. And then read verses three and four. What do you think John wants us to take away from these opening sentences of his letter? As he begins the letter, what sense do you get of what he wants us to take away of great importance, maybe from the letter as a whole? Well, having thought about those things, take a few moments now to pray. Thank God for his word, which has so much richness and connection and depth and application for us. And pray that as we study First John together, more and more, it would deepen and widen our life together with Jesus.